The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine, and one of the best of the best, one of the top selling artists, and one who can teach you so much about landscape painting is Joe McGurl. This is a segment from Advanced Landscape Painting. So I'm going to work today in a sketch that I painted out in the field and um, I wanted to paint a very simple scene of a lot of sky. Uh, one of the issues I had though is I thought something a little more interesting would happen in the skies, the sunset, and it's, instead it got a little bit less interesting. So I'm going to have to add a little interest. Now there are two things I'll work on. One is the actual sketch and one is the large painting. At some point I want to address the sketch that I did in the field, finish it up, clean up the little spot where my clamp was and uh, make that into a, a, a finished plein air painting. I'm not going to make a lot of changes because I don't like to alter my plein air sketches away from this, the scene very much, but there are a couple obvious adjustments I can make that will make the sketch a little bit more interesting and a little bit more of a painting. I'm not going to do that until I get the large painting that I'm going to make from the sketch completed or pretty much completed, at least blocked in. That way I know that this is what I started with and this is how I'm changing. It's a very conscious change and I'm doing it for specific reasons. I've also changed the proportions of the painting. So I'm going to have to make some adjustments to the composition and the small, from the small sketch in order to fit this differently shaped canvas. But one of the things I loved about the sketch was the sense of spaciousness and just sort of the idea that you can go into the scene and go on to infinity. There's not a lot in the sketch. So my idea is to make it on a large scale and uh, retain that sense of space but also make it a little bit more interesting and make the composition work a little bit better. There are a couple of different ways I recompose my plein air sketches. One thing I sometimes do is if I'm going to make some major revisions I'll place it right on the copy machine, press black and white copy and I'll run off five or six different black and white copies of it. Then I'll get a pencil, black and white pencil and I'll recompose it on the copy that I just made. This is a fairly simple composition, so I'm not going to be using the copy machine to make these interim studies. I'm going to go right onto the canvas. So I'm going to start with charcoal, and charcoal is great because it's easy to wipe off and alter things as, as you go along. A couple of things I want to address is I have a row of rocks that go right along the bottom of the painting. I don't like it in the sketch, and if I've made this painting much, much longer, it's going to be this endless row of rocks on the bottom, so it's going to be even more of an issue. So I'm going to alter this shoreline a little bit and make the rocks end at some point and have it just go into water. And also make the line where the rocks meet the ocean not quite so uniform, a little bit more regular and a little more interesting to work with. I like the rocky ledge in the in the middle ground here. In the background, I'm, there were some other islands that we could see as I was painting this uh, sketch, so I'm going to include those islands. I'll just do them from memory. I kind of know what they look like. And I'm not trying to recreate topographically everything that I saw in the scene. 
I'm trying to make a painting, but it's a painting that's based on my emotions and my impressions of that scene. So the first thing I want to do is establish the horizon line. It's going to be a very low horizon. I want a lot of sky in this painting. And I'm going to have to make the sky more interesting than it was during the day that we painted it. So I'll put some more clouds in and maybe some more interesting clouds. But it's still going to have that same atmosphere. I'm not going to turn it into like a, you know, a big thunderhead type of day because that's not what I experienced. So I'm envisioning this as being the horizon line. And this island is going to be probably the main focal point along the horizon line. Now the distribution of the land masses is really important. I don't want them evenly spaced. I don't want them the same size. So I'm going to have to vary the shape and the size and the spacing between the different islands and land masses. And this will take a little bit going back and forth. It's, as I always say, it's kind of like a Rubik's Cube. You alter one aspect. If I alter the size of this island, it also alters the shape between the islands. <clears throat> and right now, this is too similar. This, this is too evenly spaced. So I can move this island over a little bit more, maybe. And then, since this is the coast of Maine, and there are tons of islands on the coast of Maine, I could put a little one way off in the distance. So now I have a fairly large space here of just the ocean. Very tiny space, a little bigger space, and kind of a little smaller space. So there's a good variety in the spaces, and I think there's a good variety in the land masses. So I think this will work out fairly well as a way to distribute the islands across the horizon. Now I've got to figure out what to do with this foreground. As I said, I don't want a thin line of rocks going all the way across the painting. It would be very uninteresting, and it doesn't do anything. It just, it's like just poking up from the bottom. So I want something happening in the foreground that will lead me in and make it interesting to look at. This is the design aspect of the painting that I'm working on. I still want to retain the, the, the geog geology of these rocks, though. I want them to be the same type of rocks that I experienced and saw and painted. And it's a little bit tricky because there's such a thin sliver and it's so long. I've got to figure out a way to make it interesting, but also have it make sense as far as its perspective and the way these rocks would sort of lie on this, in the foreground. So um, it's going to take me a little while to design this and get it right. And there again, now I've got these somewhat equal shapes here, so I want to um, re recompose that.
what I'm trying to do is get interesting shapes that also make sense as far as their um, their proportions and the form of them. The perspective has to be right on rocks as well as on buildings, so I want to make sure that it works as far as the perspective so they sit on the on the plane, on the receding plane. Sometimes I make these directional lines that help describe the plane of those rocks. And that helps me to be able to visualize them. I kind of like this movement here, coming in and swooping up into this little mini headland here. Okay, I, I think that'll work for now. Um, then the clouds in the sketch, I envisioned them swooping in, big service clouds and coming around to the right, like a big hook leading you through the painting. But that really didn't happen as much as I wanted it to at sunset. But in the studio, I can make it happen. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm also going to put down low in the horizon some small cumulus clouds that were there earlier in the day when I started this painting. And I'm going to have them in this painting too. And they're going to help lead into the big wedge of receding space that we have. These will be small and on the horizon, a little bit dark because they're kind of in the shade of the cumulus clouds that are up above. Oftentimes, when I'm not sure where I'm going, I'll set off with a charcoal drawing. Then I'll go to a black and white gesso underpainting. And that's what I'm going to do with this. Once I've got a pretty good idea of how this is going to work linearly, I'm going to start filling in the masses in terms of their value with black gesso and white gesso, mixing it in so I have a full range of value from black to white. And that underpainting, that value range underpainting, will lock in my composition. And then it's just a matter of applying the color, the texture, and some of the details and such. But once I've got the composition locked in pretty well, then I know where I'm going to go with the painting. And I'm not going to, probably not going to make any major changes. So this gives me two opportunities to make changes in the composition. There's the first time with the charcoal and the second time with the underpainting. The other advantage of doing a black and white underpainting is that when I want to make changes, I'm not mixing up color. I'm just mixing up value, shades of gray. So I just have to match the shade of gray that I want. So I'm, I'm less resistant to making major changes because I haven't invested a lot of time. If I had done a full um, color underpainting, now I've mixed up colors. I've got to start mixing, matching colors and such to make the alterations. So this is just, um, it's quicker and makes me less resistant to making changes. So here's the black gesso. And here's the white gesso. I'm gonna need some big brushes for this. So I'll start with the big shapes in the big areas, and the biggest one is the sky. And I'm not going to worry about the clouds just yet. And that's probably too dark. But I really won't know whether it's too dark until I get pretty much the whole thing covered because 
when you're first starting out, it's hard to tell the relative value of something if there isn't a color next to it. Now, this is a really long canvas, so not only is the, the, the color of the sky going to alter from top to bottom, but in a canvas this long, it's going to alter significantly from left to right. So the sun is on the right side of the painting. So I'm envisioning that this is going to be much lighter than that. That's going to be uh, much bluer and deeper than the right side because the sun is over here. I don't want to have very many obvious brush marks in this sky. I want it to be fairly smooth. And I'm going to put some texture in the rocks, quite a bit of texture. The different elements in nature are so different as far as their characteristics go that I think that I should paint them differently too. So sky is made up of gas and dust and photons. And that's a lot different than a rock. It, our level of perception, at least. Ultimately, I guess they're all vibrating strings, according to some theories. But our experience of a rock and of the sky are completely different. So not only should I paint them different in terms of their color, but also maybe their texture should be different too. So sometimes I do that. I'll make the sky sort of ethereal and smooth and then the earth will be much more textural and kind of pronounced um, texture and volume. They'll have a little bit of volume to it. I'm going to make the earth elements thick. I'm a landscape painter. I read a little bit of physics, not that I understand a lot of it. But it adds a different element to my paintings, I think, and my thoughts and what I'm trying to accomplish with, with my art. And I think it's only natural that being a landscape painter, I would like to understand a little bit more about my subject matter. And that's what physics is, really. It's like our universe and how it works. And that's what I'm trying to paint is our universe. And in my own way, try to understand how it works. And answer the big question, what's the meaning of life? But I believe there's a spiritual component to our existence. And I want to convey that in my painting. But there's also a scientific aspect to our existence, so I want to co convey that too. And I think ultimately the two join up somewhere. I should have gotten a roller to do this. Okay, the next biggest shape is the ocean. The ocean is generally darker and more richly hued than the sky. And in my sketch, the ocean is fairly dark, so I want to retain that darkness. But the ocean can't be darker than the shadows and the rocks, so I need to leave a little bit of, bit of room in my value range so I can get some really dark shadow shapes in these rocks. That will bring them forward. Now 
Now when I get to painting the ocean, I'm going to put some texture in it. And I have a secret weapon that I'll show you and if, when I get to that stage that'll show you how I sometimes create the texture that waves have. Because a scene like this is this huge expanse of ocean and it's covered with millions of little waves. I don't want to paint all those little waves, but I want to be able to recreate the effect of looking at all those little waves. So I've got this little tool that I bought at Home Depot and it actually does a pretty good job of re replicating the look of this endless sea of waves. So I've made this main island in the middle here a little bit bigger than it is in the sketch. I'm not sure if I like it bigger. I'm going to uh, paint, paint in all the islands and then decide whether I like it bigger or not. So that's the closest one. So generally speaking, it's going to be darker than the other land masses. Move that close. I don't want that to be equidistant. Okay, so now I've got some nice pitch black that just for design purposes, I'm going to paint the shadows of these rocks with this pitch black color. It'll help to clarify the geometry of these rocks for me so I can determine whether this is what I really want to do. A lot of times these little happy accidents sort of happen, like I got this little wedge or sort of rectangular shape sticking up and I envisioned, oh, there's the side of the rock and there's the top of the rock. I didn't really draw that out, but I'm going to go with it. And it still retains the characteristics of all these rocks down here, too. So I'm painting in the shadow side of the rocks. And with rocks in particular, unless they're these sort of round, bouldery rocks, they're either getting sunlight or they're not. So every part of your rock is either going to be the sunny part or the shadow part. And that's going to determine what their shape is going to be. There's perspective to the rocks too. As they go back in space, the, sh the size of the shapes gets smaller. And they sort of stack up. So you get a series of semicircles describing the top of the rocks and they get bigger and you see more of the top of the rock as they're closer to you. But as your eye goes up, you just see sort of the very tip of the rock peeking behind the intervening rocks. Okay, time to put away the big brush. Work to a little smaller size brush. They all want to be chosen. Choose me. So there's a little bit of a breaking swell. It's not really a wave, a crashing wave. 
because I don't like painting crashing waves. There's too much energy and action to be have that stilled in a painting for me. Some artists love it and they do a great job, but for me, painting is much more still, but a nice slowly breaking swell is good. the angle of that swell wrong. Okay. Now we'll move on to these clouds and that's going to be important to have them distributed in a sort of random way that also uh, works compositionally. Perspective-wise, they're going to get smaller as they go off in the distance and also fainter. So right now it's a little bit too loop-de-loop, -loop, this line, and they all sort of go down towards this island. So I'm going to put, put a couple up here so it doesn't look so contrived. And they're too uniform in size, so I can combine some, make them much bigger. Have them overlap a little bit. Now I've repeated myself. This is one of the issues that I always face that our mind always wants to order things. And we keep doing the same shape, making the same shape, making it the same size, lining things up. So I've got my cloud here and I have it overlapping this cloud. I just did the same thing here. And when I look at this, my eye goes right to those two clouds because they mimic each other. So I've got to get rid of one of them. Um, this one. But I can put another overlapping cloud somewhere else and have it overlapping on a different side rather than the same side as this one. this one up here. And 
make these a little bit lighter on the horizon. I'm not really worrying about this too much because it's going to be a few layers of paint on top of these clouds. But just to get me thinking a little bit, sometimes I'll carry the end of painting along a little bit further, further than I would ordinarily. You see me squinting a lot. It's not because I can't see. It's because I don't want to see. I want to see big shapes rather than details. So if you squint, it blocks out a little bit of the details, and you see your shapes and your values a little bit more clearly. Eventually, I'll put on my glasses when I get to that stage. But now I'm squinting just so I can see the big shape and envision the overall composition. Let me get a straight edge. So I want to have the edge where the islands meet the ocean be fairly straight. A lot of times landscape painters, when they see a piece of land that goes back in space, it appears to go uphill because it's a little bit higher on a higher level because of the receiving plane. But they usually make it too much. Their mind is telling them that, oh, that curves up, so I have to make it curve up. It's not really curving up. It's going back in space. And the curve is very, very subtle. So this horizon is very low, and we're low to the horizon. So most of these, these areas where the islands are going to meet the ocean are going to be just about perfectly straight. This is the closest island, so this will be a little bit lower than the other islands. but not very much, just barely lower. Now this last island on the right here, the, most of the land mass is going to be in shadow. Let me mix up just a little bit darker. Color for that. And the values aren't quite right yet because in my sketch, the rocky shoreline is darker than the ocean. Here I've got it lighter than the ocean. So let me mix up a darker color there. These shorelines are getting more sunlight because they're going around and this is tilting towards the sun. This side should be darker and this side of this island should be darker. But um, right here should be also much darker. Darker, but not black. I'm not being particularly careful about this. This is just kind of for planning and thinking purposes because it's going to be a lot of paint on top of this underpainting and a lot of detail and such. The next thing I want to do is try to um, design the clouds, this big cirrus clouds. They're going to be this sort of overarching um, big shape on the top of the painting. All right, so... 
this may take a few tries to get the the arch just right. And I'm not going to worry about making it look like Sarah's clouds at this stage because that's going to be done with the oil paint. So this is, once again, I'm just working on the design really and trying to get the design so it does something beautiful and interesting. Actually, when I was out here painting, and I may, I may put some of those in, you could see the um, vapor trails from jets going through the sky. I guess they're going to Europe because this was on the coast of Maine, and I think the flight path to Europe is right over Maine. So that might be interesting to put a couple of those in. The key is to make the design really interesting, but not so contrived and sort of artificial looking. As the clouds get more, get higher in the sky, they get more diagonal the shape. As it gets lower to the horizon, they get more horizontal. So if I make the lines of the clouds, the sort of the mass of the cirrus clouds too horizontal, it doesn't look very interesting. If I make them too diagonal and sort of convoluted, it doesn't look very natural. So I've got to compromise between the two. So I don't like this negative shape here. It's pretty much the sides are parallel to each other. So let me raise this side a little bit. So these, everything that I'm painting here is going to be painted over when I do the sky because I'm going to paint the sky, the blueness of the sky first. And as I did here, put the, um, the cirrus clouds on top of it. But I want to kind of get thinking about what I'm doing and how I'm going to paint the cirrus clouds and what shape they'll be and how they're going to interact with the rest of the painting. And it'd be easy for me to change it with this, uh, just this gesso underpainting. So I don't want to do this figuring out when I've got my nice blue sky on there and then I decide I've got a major flaw in the distribution of these clouds. So I want to kind of figure it out now and if I'm going to run into a problem, run into it now rather than later on when I have a nice beautiful blue sky painted on there.
Okay, I think the problem is this cloud. It's got this curve that isn't very beautiful. So I'm going to get rid of this. It's like architecture when you see arches. Oftentimes they'll try to contemporize the arch, but it's hard to improve over the shape of a Roman arch. So you have these buildings with these really awkward looking arches in them. Some shapes are just beautiful and others aren't. And this cloud shape isn't. Same thing with boats. I can't believe the shapes that some of these naval architects put on boats these days. They look like sneakers or kitchen appliances. There's nothing beautiful and graceful anymore. So I'm going to break up this big, long swoop of cirrus cloud I have and make it into two shorter ones. I think that works better. So the main sweep of cloud is going to be this one here. So if I put in some contrails, they could be coming like this, going the opposite way from the cirrus clouds, which would be kind of interesting rather than have mimic the angle of the cirrus clouds. I kind of like those, so I'm going to leave them there for now. I don't know if I'll leave them all the way through the painting, but I probably will. I like it. And they were there, so it's truthful to what I witnessed. So I think I've got my composition pretty well locked in. And I think there's some good movement. You come along the shore sort of go out to this wave, then back to the headland, and then up to the sky. So there's a nice sort of swivel to it. Um, and for a long panel, I want you to travel from here to there. So the, the trick is how to get the eye going up there. And I think this big swoop of cirrus clouds helps. Then you sort of jump down to the activity here, and then the islands, the wave, and the foreground are going the other way, starting here, everything in reverse. But I think there's a good movement throughout the painting. So the next thing I want to do is create some texture in these rocks in the foreground. And I could do it with oil paint, but oil paint tends to crack when you paint it on really thickly. And acrylic is a little bit more rugged. And I'm also going to be using acrylic gesso, which is pretty, uh, pretty good in the flexibility department. If you've ever taken an old piece of acrylic that's dried in like your paint, paint pot or something, you can really bend it. So, I'm going to mix some acrylic in with a few jars of different mediums I have. One is glass beads, so it's like an acrylic emulsion with little glass beads. And what it does is it makes a really pronounced texture. And then I can paint some acrylic on top of it when it dries, and it's going to pick up the acrylic where the bead is and make a little bump and a little lump. So I want this foreground to be really kind of lumpy and gnarly. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give some texture to the waves. I'll show you how I do that in a little while. That's going to be done with oil paint, though. It's not going to be a lot of texture, but there's definitely going to be a textural pattern to it. So let me mix in some of these beads. I'm 
Now I'm not going to have this be as, sometimes I painted really thick texture on my paintings, but they've been on solid supports, such as wood. This is canvas, so I don't want them to make it super thick. And it's also going to be down here in the corner, which is pretty well supported, as opposed to being in the middle of the painting where it's a little more flexible. So I am a little bit concerned about the flexibility, but this won't be a problem. I'm going to put on my glasses for this. I'm also going to put the texture, generally speaking, a little bit more heavily where the sunlight is shining because that's going to really pick out all the gnarliness of the rocks. And the shadow areas are going to be a little bit more smoothly painted because in the shadow areas, the texture is less pronounced. It's all in shade. We're in the sunny areas. The sun's hitting little bits of it, and there are parts that the sun isn't hitting. So it's going to be a much more pronounced texture. Also, when I view this with it under the light, if I have a lot of textural parts in the shadow areas, those are going to be picking up all the little bits of glare from the lights. So I don't want the shadow areas to be as textural as the light areas. I'm just sort of laying it on really thick. The texture, not what I'm saying. I'm laying that on thick too, but you already knew that. This is where the underpainting came in really handy because I know where my sunny parts are, generally speaking, and where the shady parts are. I've used these beads in this medium on other paintings in the past, and boy, talk about a tenacious hold. You have to chisel it off with a chisel. So this will never fall off, that's for sure. A lot of people, when they see my paintings, they're surprised there's so much texture in them. They think there's a lot of detail. And there's, there's a lot of activity, but there's not a lot of painted detail. I like to suggest the detail and create it with texture and glazes and scratching into the paint rather than painting it all with a little tiny brush. Put a little back here where the wave is breaking and where this ledge is. So I think I made the studio painting more interesting than the plein air painting. And that oftentimes is my, times is my goal. A lot of times when I'm doing a plein air painting, I look at what I've I'm going to paint, and I realize it's not the most dynamic and action-packed and amazing subject matter, but there's something that I like about it. And I know that if I can get the information, the sort of the, the raw facts down, I can go to the studio and make something more interesting out of it. Because my goal when I'm plein air painting isn't to make a plein air painting. It's to make a painting, and that usually means a studio painting. So. That's sort of my, where I go to for my information, for the facts. I kind of look at myself as if I were a novelist writing a, a, a novel that was fiction but based on fact.
I also had kind of a cool idea for the frame for this. I thought I'd get a big driftwood log and have that on the bottom as like a shelf and then have a thin floater frame around it. I don't know, just a thought. As this is drying, the medium is evaporating. So I'm putting another layer on. Put just a little bit of this on this island here. The other ones are too far and the texture is going to be kind of too indistinct and subtle in the background, but this island could have a little bit maybe. When, when the, this uh, glass bead medium dries, I can go back in with a knife and carve and shape it a little bit more too, to get the, um, the shapes and the effect that I want. I'm going to put a little texture here in the shoreline where the wave is hitting the rock or a little swell is hitting the rock and maybe breaking just a little bit. Okay, so now we're going to let this dry and after it dries, I'm going to go back in with some color and start putting in a very thin wash of color to try to get, start getting me back into the, um, the color scheme that I want. I may do a little bit of manipulating on the texture I just put in also. It may need a second coat. So if it does, we'll come in and do that before I put on the color. But we'll let it dry and see how it looks. So we're back to this large painting and the sky is dried enough for me to work on it. For a basis, I'm going to use the painting that we did out of doors. And I'm going to adjust the color just a little bit. As I was cleaning up my paint from the outdoor session, the sky got much warmer along the horizon. And I'd like to get that sky a little bit warmer. It'll look, it'll look a little bit more interesting and a little bit more colorful. So I'm going to mix up a gradation of blue going from a sort of a pale blue into a much lighter yellowy blue and that down near the horizon, a warmer orange, um, a little bit of orange mixed into the blue. If 
But other than that, I'm going to keep this guy pretty much the same gradation that I have it there. So I've mixed up a slurry of, of white with a lot of um, turpentine. The first passage through the painting is going to be thin because I just want to get into the general range of colors. That way I'll be able to compare my colors and values. It's hard to tell what a color looks like until you've got it, until you have the adjacent colors next to it blocked in. And I could just match the colors from this panel, and I will somewhat, but by the time I get this whole thing covered, I may decide to make some adjustments. So I want to keep my underpainting quite thin. It'll dry more quickly. And archivally, you kind of want to go from lean to rich as far as your oil content. The first layers of paint won't have very much or any medium in with it. And then the subsequent layers, you'll start adding more and more oil. And you also want your first layers of paint to be a little bit thin and your subsequent layers to be thicker. Just out of curiosity, let me put a dot on there, see how far off I am. Uh, it's pretty close, just about exact. The other issue is when I put on the next layer of paint, I don't want it to be too thick because I'm going to be doing a lot of soft blending. And I don't want to have a lot of paint that I've got to move around as I do the blending. So if I get this layer pretty much covering the canvas, I won't have to worry about the second layer hiding the underpainting. As we move away from the sun, the colors get cooler in the sky. It gets a little bit cooler and darker. So I don't mind painting over, over all of this underpainting that I did. The reason I did the underpainting is to kind of try it out and 
things like when I had the repeating cloud shapes, when I paint the clouds on top of this sky that I'm painting now, I'll remember not to make repeating cloud shapes. So down near the horizon here is where I want to make this much warmer than I have it in the sketch. The sketch it's a little bit too light and too pink. So I want to warm this up and make it a little bit deeper than, in color than I have it in the sketch. Now it's hard for me to judge the exact color of the sky until I get a base of color on the water. Right now the sky looks very high intensity in its coloration. It looks a lot stronger than I want it to. But that's because I'm looking at it next to all this massive gray. Also as I blend the orange up into the blue and the blue down into the orange since they're opposite colors they're going to modify each other so my orange won't be quite as intense and my blue won't be quite as intense my final layer i'm going to be much more careful about the blending and the application of of paint this is just to give me an idea of the color and to get it so I don't have to paint. Forget that. This is just to get my first application of color. And when I put on my final coat, I'll be most of the way there color wise, so I won't have to worry about it not covering well enough since I have this nice base of under, under paint. For the final layer, I'm going to get a bigger brush. I hate washing brushes, so I'm going to stick with this one for this layer. Sometimes down near the horizon, away from the sun, it gets just a little bit purple. So I'm going to do that and blend that purple up into the sky a little bit. But I don't want this to be like a real sunset. It's late, late in the afternoon. It's our early evening, but it's not a sunset. So this is my tool for creating texture. It's a striating tool that decorative painters would use. They would paint the wall a solid color, then put a coat of glazing liquid with some color in it and then drag this up and down the wall and it would create this striated effect. It's little discs and they have notches in them. So when I first got this and I used it, I put on a layer of paint and I dragged this through much like you would as if you were a decorative, doing a wall with um, the striated decorative painting technique. But the discs made this repeating pattern and I didn't like that. So what I've done is I let the paint dry in these discs a little bit. I don't clean it very good. And that way, each disc is unique. It makes its own unique shape. Some of the discs are fatter, some are a little bit longer. And every now and then, I'll scrape some of the paint out to give some really thin discs also. So now I have a good variety of shapes. And when I drag this through the water, it has that striated effect that you often see if you're at the beach and you're sort of low to the horizon and there's just a mass of waves. There's all this texture. So rather than getting in there with a tiny brush, in painting all the ways are just sort of indicating them with sort of broad brush marks. I can use this without having to do a lot of sort of meticulous painting that really don't give the life and the energy that I see in water. Um, this does a better job of representing that because I'm not in there painting each one, but there is a, a wealth of activity. 
So I'm going to take this paint that I've been working with. I put some liquid impasto with it because I want the paint to have a little bit of body. I want it to retain the texture of the tool. I also want the paint that I mix up to be slightly lighter than the painting, the paint for the water in my sketch because I'm going to put a glaze on top of this and then after I put on the glaze I may manipulate the paint further. But if I don't make it slightly lighter, if I made it the exact color I want, then if I put the glaze on it would be wrong. So you've got to paint, when you work with glazes, you've got to paint it wrong to make it right. Because if, if the base color you put is exact color, the exact color you want, your glaze isn't going to be able to be used to its fullest advantage because you'll be putting a glaze on the exact same color. And let me put a dot on my painting so I can see how far off I am. Okay, I could go a little bit lighter actually. And not quite as vibrant. So, put some white. A little black will gray down that color. And I want a, l a little more uh, liquid and pasta to get a little thicker. Now there are a couple of ways you can handle this tool. One way is to put the paint out, so it is smear it out, roll your roller in the paint and then apply it to the surface like that. I've done that. Or I can paint the surface and drag it through the wet paint. Or I can paint the surface, drag it through the wet paint and then get a soft brush and just blur the, uh, the waves a little bit. I can also, if I'm up high, I can use it to, sh um, to show curved waves, how the, the, if you're up high, you can see the curvature of the waves as they come in towards the beach. So for this one, I'm going to paint the, the water a solid, with a solid layer of paint, and then drag the, the uh, tool through the wet paint. Now the problem with this, obviously, is see how light I'm painting that? So that's not going to be helpful in me determining whether this color is right or not until I put the glaze on. I've got to have enough paint on here that when I drag this through it will make the texture. If there's not enough paint it's not going to make enough of the pattern that I'm looking for. So there's a lot of tools that I use when I paint in the studio that aren't typical painting artist, fine artist painting tools. Um, I use a lot of steel wool, um, sanding certain areas of my painting. I use sponges that watercolor painters use, but Oil painters don't, I guess, because you really can't clean it after you've used it. But that's okay. I'll use the sponge and then throw it out. But sometimes I can get some really unique textures and marks for foliage by using a sponge. I use combs that wood grainers use to grain wood. I use seagull feathers. In fact, this cir cirrus clouded sky would be a good place to use the seagull feathers, but I think my clouds, everything's going to be so big, the feathers aren't going to be large enough. But I've used them on smaller paintings with cirrus clouds. So when I worked with my dad years ago, he was a, a muralist and he did a lot of decorative painting and also um, wood graining and marbleizing. We used to use seagull feathers to draw the veins through marble. 
And one day I was doing it, I thought, boy, that looks like cirrus clouds. So at a certain point I was, I thought I should try that. So I got some seagull feathers, painted a painting with cirrus clouds in it. And it was amazing how much, oops, the grain, uh, it was amazing how much the seagull feathers dragged through the paint, replicated the effect of cirrus clouds. So then my mother-in-law and father-in-law went to, they heard about it, they went to the beach, they brought me back an enormous bag of seagull feathers. I still have some of the feathers today. So I want to get the distribution of the paint somewhat uniform so I don't have blotches where there is the pattern and other blotches where there's not enough paint to make the pattern. And I can control how big the striations are by how much paint I have on the surface. If I want to have really aggressive marks made by the tool, I can put a lot of paint on the surface. And I would do that if it was a much rougher sea and if I, was, if I were closer to it. But this is a fairly calm ocean. In fact, after I use the tool when it dries and I put on the glaze, I may have some calm patches where I'll, I'll smooth out the marks that the tool made. So I'm going to put on my glasses for this so I can see what I have for texture and what the tool is going to do as I drag it through the paint. So I'm going to put the paint on a little more th thickly in the foreground of the painting because I want bigger waves. So if I put on more paint, I'll have bigger indentations from the tool. I'm also going to make the foreground color a little bit darker and a little bit greener because it's closer to us and we're going to be seeing into the, into the water a little bit because water is translucent or transparent depending where you are. Um, so I want to get a little bit of that translucent effect and also that'll indicate that the water is coming towards us, it's closer than the water that's more towards the horizon. Okay, so let's try the magic. I want to keep this really horizontal because I don't want my waves to be going up and down loopy like that. Here in the foreground, they're getting, they're going to be a little bit bigger and more pronounced because I put more paint on the surface. I think this, I, it was a Martha Stewart collection of wood or of, um, decorative painting tools. But I haven't found it at, I think I got it at Home Depot originally. But if you go online and you looked at striating tool, you might be able to find it. Okay, so I think that went pretty well. 
I've got a nice um, pattern there that's going to replicate the ocean waves. I want to break up the pattern a little bit, so I'm going to get, especially in the foreground, um, I'll try a couple of things, maybe the back of my brush, and just dragging it through here and there, making some bigger waves. In the distance, the waves are going to be fairly uniform because when things move into the distance, everything averages out. So if you have a big wave, as it moves into the distance, relatively speaking, it's smaller, and it averages out with all the other waves. But in the foreground, things don't average out. They're much more individual and unique. It's like when you see a hillside and there are individual trees when you're close up it looks very irregular, but as a, as a hillside moves into the distance and you look at, it, say, a ridge line that's five miles away, it looks like almost a perfectly straight line. All the trees sort of average out, the tall ones average out, and the small ones average out, and you have more of a straight line. further the way you get from the ocean, the more pattern and rhythm you see. Like when you're in a plane and you look down at the waves, they look very rhythmic. But when you're sitting at eye level and looking right in the surf, they look chaotic and there's no pattern to it. So here in the foreground, they're going to be much more, the waves will be more individual and chaotic and random. And in the distance, they'll be more uniform. It's like in physics, the randomness in the universe is dependent upon the scale that you're looking at it at. Some things appear random because of the scale that you're, the, the observer is viewing them. So if you change the scale, suddenly you see order rather than chaos and randomness. Now I'm going to get emails from lots of physicists saying, well, not exactly. <laughs> This is the rubber um, paint shaper or artist wipeout tool. I'm going to try this, dragging this through a little there again to give more variety to these waves that are close to me. And then when I'm painting them, I can paint in some of the waves too. I don't have to just sculpt the waves. Some of them can be painted. So I'll have several different layers of texture and paint quality. There's going to be glazes. There's going to be um, impasto areas. There's areas that were made with the striating tool. There's areas that were made with the paintbrush. And now areas made with this rubber nib. I can also turn this nib different directions because there's a flat edge, sort of wide, broad edge here, and then there's the tip, which is narrow. So by turning this tool different ways, I can make different size marks and different shaped marks. Go back to the back of it. As I get further into the distance, I want my marks to be smaller. 
course, one of the questions is, I don't know if this is going to work. Every time I do it, I do something slightly different because I want a different effect, but I'm not sure if what I'm doing is really going to work until I put the glaze on and start manipulating the subsequent layers of paint. But experimenting and doing different things is kind of one of the things that, for me, makes painting fun, rather than doing sort of the safe thing that I know will work because I've done it a million times in the past. This is the first time I've actually used all these tools in this wet paint. Let me get something even thinner in the end. I also have these sculpting tools that I use often. It's very sharp points. I use it to scratch into paint, wet paint or dry paint. So let me try this in the background just to break up the uniformity of the pattern sort of in this area. Way back in the deep space, I want them to be uniform. As I was saying, things get more uniform as they get further from us. I shouldn't say as the, cha as the scale changes, sometimes things get more uniform. So I've got a big blob of paint over here. And actually, I could use that for the top of that rock. But if I have any big blobs of paint that aren't sitting in space where they should be, I can knock it down with this tool. For instance, if there was a big, you know, aggressive blob of paint back here, that wouldn't work spatially. So the tool, as I was saying, nature is a, a constant fight between order and chaos. And the striating tool creates the order. And these marks that I'm making create the chaos. But if I made, if I just left it with the striating tool, the effect wouldn't work because there's too much order. If I did the whole thing with these different brush ends and striating tool, I mean, um, rubber wipeout tool, artist wipeout tool, it would be too much chaos. It would just like, like a big mishmash of paint texture. So I want to balance the two, the order and the chaos. And by using a tool that creates order and one that creates chaos, I can control that a little bit. I'm thinking of dragging the tool one more time through this area that I've just put all this texture in. It won't obliterate the texture completely, but it might knock down some of the parts that are too, too out of whack with everything else. If it doesn't work, I can go back in with all these tools and redo it. But let me try um, just one pass with the tool. Actually, it'll be two passes, one up higher, one down lower, because it won't fit one. Yeah, that worked. So I didn't lose all of my texture that I carved in there, but I um, knocked down some of the big blobs that really were too aggressive. And um, yeah, I think that'll work. So the next thing we have to do is let that dry completely. And then we can go in with a glaze 
actually paint the glaze and have everything filled in all the cracks and crevices then wipe it down it'll pick it up off the surfaces but the cracks and crevices will retain the glaze and I'll have this two-tone effect the deeper color and this base color showing through I'll probably lightly sand it too just a little bit before I put on the glaze that'll do a couple things it'll help the glaze um, adhere and it'll also knock down any lumps and big bumps that I have that are going to interfere with the effect that I want. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. As an artist, you're on a journey. A journey to achieve at the highest possible level, to see your artwork reach the pinnacle of accomplishment, so that you're embraced by collectors who clamor to get your artwork in their collection. But practice alone will only take you so far, and if you're not careful, you'll be practicing bad habits that can stick with you for the rest of your painting life. And once you're stuck, you won't be getting as good as you could become. To make the leap to a higher level of painting, you need an advanced professional guiding you. A painter who is not only a proven success, but one whose work is considered the best of the best. Artist Joseph McGurl is known around the world as one of the finest living landscape painters on earth. His award-winning paintings are represented by the top galleries and owned by the top collectors. And his prices are among the highest in his craft because he is known as the best. That's why he has the rare distinction of having been appointed as a living master by the world-renowned Art Renewal Center. Known for his paintings of glorious light and atmosphere, which have a feeling so realistic they come alive, his paintings draw the viewer into the scene. Now, you have a chance to advance your own painting skills by learning directly from this living master in this important new video course, appropriately titled Advanced Landscape Painting. This is a rare peek into the full painting process Joseph McGurl uses to create his magnificent studio pieces. You'll see nearly every brush stroke as Joe walks you through a complete painting that begins with the outdoor sketch on a rocky main shoreline. Then, while in his studio, he explains every step to you as he transforms that sketch into a large, fully refined studio painting. Artists at every level will gain important knowledge from what is offered in this 15-hour video course. And the better you become, you'll get more out of watching it again and again. Advanced Landscape Painting with Joseph McGurl is rich in valuable content and one that you will treasure as it guides you to advance your skills. Available on both DVD and digital format to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Be sure to order your copy today. Well, that was Advanced Landscape Painting with Joe McGurl, and in this video, he goes into a lot of depth about his entire process, starting with plein air painting and all the way through all the glazing. Advanced Landscape Painting, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's learn more about Joe. Well, we're here today with Joe McGurl, and we want to find out what makes Joe tick. So what is it? What's the answer to that great question? Um, I guess it's passion for what I do. Um, I've, since I was a child, I knew I wanted to be an artist. My father was an artist, so I grew up with that in the sort of in my blood, I guess. And um, 
Now, when I was a kid, I was always drawing and really got a lot of enjoyment out of it. And as I got older, I realized that this is something I wanted to pursue. I went to art college, and it was in the 70s when there wasn't a lot of focus on representational painting. And so there was this small group of sort of, I guess you would call them rebels, who were doing representational painting <coughs> as opposed to the majority of our classmates who were doing abstract and conceptual type of artwork. Uh, once I got through college, I um, pursued a couple other things for a short period of time, but came back to art and to painting in particular because um, it was the one thing that really gave me a real sense of fulfillment and it was challenging. I wasn't able to paint what I wanted to paint the way I wanted to paint it. So there's always something to strive for, always trying to get better. And I uh, eventually hooked up with Robert Cormier, who was a, um, a teacher and an artist at the Guild of Boston Artists in Boston. And he was trained in the 19th century French Academy methods of drawing and painting. Who did he study with? He studied with R.H. Ives Gamel, who was a student of Paxton, and he studied with Jerome, Jerome. And, and such. So there was this wonderful chain of knowledge that was handed down through the generations. And I studied with him, and it was a real turning point because he taught me the sight size method of drawing, and also just this philosophy that it's really important to be careful and exact and accurate in your drawing. And then you can expand from there, but you have to, at some stage, be able to reproduce things with a great deal of fidelity to the actual thing that you're painting or drawing. And that taught me to really slow down and be really careful and observant about um, my artwork. You're meticulous when you paint. Um, when you see my paintings finished, they're meticulous, but in the process, they're actually pretty sloppy. And there are several layers and several different um, techniques that I use. But I guess I'm, in, I'm meticulous in how I want them to end up in the, in the end. But I do a lot of manipulating with the paint surface. I'll scratch it and sand it, um, carve into it, put on really thick impasto paint and glaze it and such. So there's a lot of processes and manipulating of the paint that goes on. And that helps me to um, reproduce the effects found in nature in paint. And one of my goals is to try to capture the reality that we experience in real life in paint on a painted surface. It's really quite an abstract concept because you have reality that we experience in three dimensions, or actually many dimensions we know now, and time, and it's a full of uh, this frenzy of activity on a subatomic level, and um, we have all our senses activated. And then we're trying to boil that down into one sense, just your sense of vision. And even at that, you're shutting one eye because you're seeing it flat. And so you're trying to take this multi-dimensional experience and convert it into a one-dimensional visual experience, which is really quite an abstract process. And that's one of the things that intrigues me um, now these days is uh, creating that one-dimensional representation of a multi-dimensional process. And I think that even when I was a kid, that was still the thing that fascinated me with art, was that I could portray these things that either happened to me or that I imagined or I saw on a piece of paper. And that transference, it's a really an abstract, very abstract concept. And that's the thing that made it, it like magic. You know, people always talk about the magic of art. And for me, transferring this multi-dimensional surface into one dimension is the real magic. So the, <clears throat> but a lot of people will misread what you've said and say, well, you're painting a photograph. But you're not. I mean, your, your paintings don't look photographic, yet they look, they, they don't look photorealistic, yet they look alive and real. So what's the difference? Uh, well, the big difference is that I don't use photographs at all. I, I never use them. Um, and that's what you said is actually what I'm trying for, is to make them look real, not photographic. There's this whole, you know, a lot of times people say, oh my God, it looks just like a photo. <laughs> and they mean it as a compliment, and that's all fine. But my goal, you, you know, photography mimics painting, actually. When they invented photography, it was great because it looks like a painting, but it's, you know, a different process. But my purpose, my goal is to try to make my paintings look real and express the reality that we experience as human beings. There's, with reality, I consider myself a realist as well as a contemporary luminist. But the realist part, I'm trying to portray reality 
as we experience it. There's an ultimate reality throughout the universe that we can't experience because our senses are limited. For instance, a bat experiences reality in a much different way than we do. And a camera, there again, experiences, experiences reality in a way different than we do. So I don't want those interferences coming into my artwork. So well, I and, and photographs lie. Photographs deepen the shadows. Mm -hmm. They slightly skew the perspective. There's a lot of things in photographs that aren't what you see. Right, exactly. And they can't experience things the way a human being can experience, just like a bat can't experience things the way a human being can't experience them. So I'm trying to portray the reality, it's a humanistic reality, the way we as humans respond to nature and the way we can sort of try to understand it. And ultimately, it sort of leads to the big question, you know, what is what's life? What's the meaning of life? What is it all about? And when I'm well, in the It's field, funny you should mention that because that was gonna be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> what the meaning of life is. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, when I'm in the field painting landscapes, I really feel close to that question. I obviously don't feel close to the answer, but I feel like this is where the answer would be found. Somewhere contemplating nature and trying to be sort of one with nature and where the, almost the line between myself and the landscape that I'm painting disappears. But the painting is kind of a conduit between that line. It goes from ultimate reality to the reality that I can experience, to the painting, and then to me, or actually maybe to me and then the painting. But there's the three of us. There's reality, there's me as a human, my humanistic interpretation of reality, and the painting that sort of results from that. And for you, what is that experience? Obviously, we have this demonstration of you going through the process, but when you're out on your own and you don't have a camera, following you around and the discomfort of all the lights and all the other things that go with it. What, what is your typical experience when you go out? Um, is, is it different than other painters? Do you approach it differently? Yeah, I think it's different. I think every artist has their own little way that they approach things and they're all right and they're all wrong. I mean, for, for myself, my way is fairly unique because my philosophy is, is unique to, to me. So. These other artists who I greatly admire, but you know, some of them use photos, some of them are really strong colorists and such, and they're doing something different than me. So they're right pursuing that for them to reach their goals. But for my goals, I have something a little bit unique to me. And to, usually when I'm going out uh, plein air painting, I'm looking for something interesting. It could be a light effect, it could be something geological or meteorological, just something that fascinates me and I'll make a painting or a sketch of that because I'm trying to understand it, what's happening, how are the different elements reacting and interacting and, and such. And I'm not so much concerned about making a painting. There are a lot of plein air artists who will go out and their goal is to make a painting, a finished work of art. My goal is to go out and understand nature on a much deeper level. And by not using a photograph, it forces me to concentrate really, really deeply at what I'm looking at and try to understand it and decipher it because when I leave the field I don't have anything to refer to other than what I painted during that session. So a lot of times I'll just keep digging in and trying to get everything, all the information I can out of that site. Then I'll take the plein air painting back to the studio and I may, may never turn it into a finished painting but it's allowed me to understand na this little aspect of nature a little bit more deeply. And after doing this for 30 years, I've got this storehouse of knowledge of the different forms of nature, how they interact and how they work, so I can make things up. It gives me a lot of opportunity to be much more creative and imaginative because I don't have to worry about, oh, how do I make this look right and fit in the landscape? So I can invent these completely imaginary landscapes, but they have enough truth to them that they're believable. Um, right now, most of my paintings are imaginary, probably 80% are completely made up from my imagination with no sketch to go on. It's sort of this accumulation of knowledge that I've sort of accumulated and sort of apply to the painting that I'm looking at. So can you impart some of that knowledge on us? Uh, you've got a lot of painters who are watching this who are trying to figure out their, <clears throat> their direction, their ride, their, the, you know, the, the goal should not be for them to mimic you, should be to find their own voice. But mm -hmm. 
there's a starting point. They want to, they respect you. They want to learn what you know. What is it that perhaps you might approach a little differently in some of the knowledge that you've, you, you're willing to share that might help some of these painters go on their path in the proper way? Right. Um, I, well, the first thing is just spending a lot of time in the landscape. Um, and staying with one theme, I think, helps a little bit. For instance, when I find something that's interesting, if I find a location that really intrigues me, I'll go back to that again and again and do maybe a dozen paintings of that one spot, some drawings or whatever. But at the end of this session, I understand what I'm looking at so much more deeply than if I was going around and sort of painting these snapshots of a quick little a painting here, another painting over there. So by this sort of intense focus, it allows me to concentrate really very deeply on sort of one aspect. And then when I think I've explored that enough, I'll move on to something else or something else will catch my attention and intrigue me. A lot of times when I go on a painting trip, for instance, I'll spend the first few days sort of moseying around looking for different things. And eventually something will speak to me and it just has this really strong presence. And I'll spend the rest of the time analyzing that. Um, a few years ago, I went to Italy and I found this stone structure and I painted it from all different sides and different times of the day. And it was just a wonderful experience and it allowed me to really delve into that much, much more deeply. Mm -hmm. On sort of a practical level, um, I consider myself a contemporary luminist also, as I said, uh, mentioned previously, and that means that light is really important to me. So I'm always thinking about what the light is doing. And when you look at a landscape, you want to determine whether the objects in the landscape are in the light or in the shade. And it's sort of like never the two shall meet. So um, a lot of beginner painters in particular, they sort of have this fuzzy area in the middle where the light's on one part of the object and then it turns into this sort of no man's land and then it's in the shade. But if you look at nature, that half light is very tiny. It's a very thin sliver. So generally speaking, you want to look at things and say, is this in the light or is this in the shade? And I'm always thinking of that, no matter what I'm painting, in the back of my mind is always, what is the light doing? And, and, the light and, and that half light is, a, is typically, if I understand it right, more, typically more chroma, more, is there a particular trick to that? They used to call it, I think in the Boston school, they called it the bed bug line. You're right, exactly. Um, I, I think it depends on the object and the, the quality of light and such, whether it's more chrome or more value, but it is a transition. And one of the things I learned in the Boston School from uh, the figure in cast drawing is that transition is very sharp. It's much sharper than most people make it. A lot of people, if you paint a ball, for instance, a lot of people make the transition from light to shade much too subtle and much too soft. But if you actually look at that ball, it's almost a very hard line with just the edge of that bed bug line um, shade uh, in half light and softened. So I think um, being aware that objects are either in the light or in the shade helps a lot. And also it helps to think of the form also because the light is describing the form. Without the light you have no form. For instance, even on a cloudy day, suddenly the form begins to dissolve. So if you're painting on a sunny day, the light is going to help enhance the sense of form. And there again we're painting a flat object and we're trying to convince the viewer that it's in three dimensions. So by increasing that sense of light and paying real close attention to the sunny part and the shady part and a little bit of a half light part, we create a greater sense of form which creates a greater sense of depth in the painting. So that's the other thing I'm always thinking about when I'm painting something is the form. For instance, a cloud, a rock, and a tree all have a similar form. They're sort of these maybe oblong objects with a top and a front and sides and a bottom and a back. The only difference between them are, are the details and the, um, the actual sort of surface of them. But generally speaking, they have the same overall form. So you always want to remember that there's a, a form to everything and that helps give you that three-dimensional quality that we're looking for. So everybody has to go through a learning process. Everybody has to go through a lot of bad paintings and a lot of bad drawings and, and <clears throat> there are no shortcuts. Right. <laughs> but if there were any, what would they be? Oh my gosh. Well, I guess the, I think the first thing that people struggle with is just trying to make things look real. And you're right, there are no shortcuts. Um, the Planner Painters of America group that I'm in with, we, um, we talk about admitting new members and all the members seem older and we don't have any young members. And it's because it takes a long time to be able to do this at a high level. 
every now and then you'll have an aberration like Sajin, who seemed like by the time he was 15 could paint amazingly. But generally speaking, it just takes a lot of hours and a lot of time put in the field to be able to paint. And I wish there were a shortcut because I would, I would still like to use it. <laughs> I think the first thing you struggle with, though, is just trying to make things look real. But you're not really a professional until you've reached that level where you can make things look real and now you have something to say. And art is communication and it's communicating an idea. So there has to be some type of an idea behind your art to sort of give it a purpose and give it a meaning. Otherwise, it's just sort of a beautiful rendering. You know, everything looks very, um, everything is very aesthetically pleasing and it's a beautiful painting, but it doesn't say anything. Yeah. And it's not about something. And, it would be like a poem that has beautiful rhythm and such, but at the end you say, well, what was the poet trying to convey? What right. idea? Right. So um, that's the next step that you take after you can render things. And it took me years and years before I really knew what I was, what I was saying. And it's funny because it's something that was in, within me all the time. And eventually I just, it sort of bubbled up and I realized this is what my art is about. Well, I, I studied photographer, photography with... Uh, uh, very well-known photographer and I went to a, my first workshop and we were focusing on very basic technique and but and I said but I want to go out and photograph trees and rocks and whatever and he says no 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 the creative comes after you learn the technique he said you want to get to the technique to the point where you can do it in your sleep where it's second nature because once it's second nature then whatever it is flowing inside of you that you want to speak out about the scene is what will come out, but you can't do it until you at least get the technical part out. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. When I was in college, one of the things I used to say, this is in the 70s, remember, is that, well, this technique's going to stifle your creativity. Right. And actually the opposite is true because my big problem when I was younger was that I didn't have the technique to express what I wanted to express. If you have the technique, then nothing stops you from expressing your ideas. So you want to get your technique down first so you can paint anything and you're not struggling with rendering things. And then you can express your creativity. Um, a lot of times it seems like artists put the horse before the cart and the cart before the horse. Same thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're, you know, they're trying to be expressive, but they're just not, they don't have the technical chops to do it. So you, and there again, it just requires putting in the hours and the time, and it takes a long time. So how, how do you feel about this um, plein air movement? There's thousands of artists now that are painting outdoors, so that's changed a lot since you started, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of shows, and dare I say, there's a lot of uncooked work out there that's getting into the market. Do you have any feeling about any of that? Um, well, I think the, it's great that we have this big, vibrant, vigorous movement. When I was first started plein air painting, they didn't have all these pochard boxes and French easels and such. I had a, the only thing I could find was this big wooden suitcase that weighed about 40 pounds and took five, 10 minutes to set up. Uh, but because the demand is so great, now there are you know, dozens and dozens of manufacturers of pochard boxes and plein air painting supplies. and all t types of events that people can get organized with. Sometimes there may be a, an issue with there just being so much that the quality goes down because there are only so many good painters and there's only so many good paintings when the more venues you have, the more work they have to accept to fill the venue and such. So I guess it's like, you know, it's like everything. It's a little bit of a compromise and, you know, maybe the quality's not quite as good as it could be, but it's great to have this vigorous movement that's, you know, Right now, representational painting, plein air painting, is one of the biggest movements in the country. Unfortunately, the art establishment seems to be totally dismissive of it, which is kind of strange, but um, I guess that's the world we live in as representational painters. Well, I'd like to go there for a second. Um, you, you showed me something when we were together in Maine a bunch of us all gathered upstairs in this one room at this house and you gave a little PowerPoint presentation, mm -hmm. some thoughts on what was happening in the, in the art world and yeah. how that was all somewhat manipulated. Are you willing to talk about that? Uh, sure, yeah, a little bit. It, 
we don't have enough time for me to go into the whole thing because I could go on. But uh, yeah, I guess one of the frustrations is the, the amount of money that's in the, the um, contemporary um, establishment art world is just, it's overriding the quality and it seems like money is the un, sort of the, the big influence in pushing that movement forward. And a lot of times you'll see shows at museums and it's sort of the same artists and it's the same work that's being promoted and it's all backed by a lot of investment in the part of the museum and investors and such. And I think that there's so much money that it makes what we do really irrelevant because you have a piece of artwork that's exhibited in a museum and it, you know, things similar to that had sold for $20, $50 million. And we come in with our paintings that are $50,000, $60,000. And how can there be any parity between the two? So then you say, well, obviously this is a much better artwork because it's you know, $50 million worth and this is only a $50,000 painting. So that has virtually you know, no relative value. So it's hard to fight that juggernaut of money that's infiltrated the contemporary art world. And the museums are spending a lot of money that, on artwork that's been manipulated in the, um, in the auctions and buying and selling and such. So I think it's frustrating as representational painters to try to fight that and f somehow find a way to make our art somewhat legitimate in light of the money that these, um, the contemporary outwork is that world that they're sort of delving into, which is well. What, so why does it matter? Influenced. Why does it matter if we fight it? Because <clears throat> with uh, obviously, there's nothing wrong with money and making money as a painter, and it'd be great to be able to get 50 million or 20 million for a painting. But with that, may come some compromises that seem to be occurring in the other side of the art world. A mm -hmm. lot of compromises that seem to be being made. Right. Um, and I would think someone like yourself wouldn't be willing to make those compromises over money alone. No, and I don't think we want to get 50 or 60 million dollars and have our paintings be manipulated by investors and auction houses and such. But I guess what I would like to see is at least some acknowledgement that this huge movement is going on. Right now it's the most vigorous art movement in the country and it's completely ignored by the art establishment. And one of the reasons is because the money that the art establishment is entangled with is such a, a big nut for us to crack that we just can't make any headway into that, into that whole world. Um, and art shouldn't, you know, it isn't about money for most of the artists that I know. It's about, you know, doing something that they love. Obviously we need money to survive, so we have to sell our paintings and such. And I don't have a complaint with even the money that the abstract painters are making at all. That's fine. It's just that it's this roadblock that we're up against. Right. And we can't get into that club without, you know, with the, the disparity between the money that we, the, the perceived value, I should say, between our paintings and their artwork. Yeah, there's the sense of this can't be good and that can't be good. It's, this can be good, this can be expensive, but that can't. It's so it's not really inclusionary, which is kind of the opposite of what everybody preaches in that world, but uh, it's okay to be exclusionary of something that they want to diss, which mm -hmm. is basically something that, you know, if you can tell what it is, it's not acceptable in their world. It right. Seems. Um, it's where, where the Impressionists were in the 1860s, where, you know, in, in those days the establishment wasn't accepting their artwork. And basically the, the gallery auction houses and the galleries, the auction houses and the sal uh, museums are the salon of the 20th and 21st century. And we just can't get through the door just in the same way that the Impressionists couldn't get into the salon in the 1860s. Mm -hmm. um, we're the revolutionaries now. That's right. Um, and you know, this is the type of art that people respond to. And museums are supposed to reflect the society, one of their aspects one of their functions is to reflect the society that um, yeah, at a certain period of time. And if you, in a couple of hundred years, if you look at what the museums are collecting, you would say, well, there was no representational painting going on in America at all right. because they don't have any of it. So in a way it's doing a disservice to future generations because they will assume that all of the American 
art appreciating public where they were buying Jeff Koons sculptures and um, Damien Hurst and such. Sharks. When it's, there's a very small segment of extremely wealthy investors who were buying those. But the public at large and the art lovers at large were not buying them. They're buying them, putting them in storage, waiting a few years, bringing them out of storage, and hopefully selling them for more money. Absolutely. Most of that, a good part of that work ends up in storage till it comes out again after it's appreciated. And yeah. Anything else that you would like to share with the people on this DVD that you, you think might be helpful for them to know or understand? Um, I think that you have to have that passion that I spoke about, or spoke about earlier in order to really blossom and to move forward in, in the art world. You can, if you want to be a hobbyist and you dabble with it and such, that's great. And there's, you know, there's room for that too. But if you have that passion, it's sort of something that comes out of you and you find that you have to do it all the time. And I basically, I paint all the time. I probably put in about 100 hours a week hmm. at the easel. And it's because I love it. It's the thing that I love to do. And if, um, if there's any way I can get more painting time in, I, <laughs> I always try to find that extra few hours or extra few minutes. Having a studio in the house is great, too, because I'm at home with the family, too. But um, I think it's following your passion, putting in the hours in the field. Um, making intelligent decisions and thinking about what you're painting and why you're painting it. There's sort of three different elements to my art. There's the empirical, the rational, and the humanistic. And the empirical is the stuff that I see when I'm out painting a landscape. Um, I'm observing things and I'm recording them. Then the rational is something I do back in the studio where I reinvent paintings, but it's all sort of because of the knowledge I've gained. I can say, well, if this rock is going to be in this position, there's going to be another rock here, and there's going to be a beach section here and a tree up there. So I can, rash I can think logically how the progression from shoreline to upland would go in a landscape. Mm -hmm. So I'm making that up, but I'm making it up based on the empirical observations I had in the field. And then the final element is the humanistic aspect. It's what I bring to it, which the thing that makes the paintings unique to me. Like, you know, there's a lot of flaws in my art and there's a lot of strengths and, and such, but it's all part of me. And back to the camera thing, I would rather have my flaws, but also it be going through my filter rather than have this photographically accurate depiction of what I'm doing. So the, the more direct connection I can have to the subject, I think the more of, of myself is, is put into the painting, where if I had a photograph, it would be going through the filter of the photograph and then th back to me. So um, I, th I think that, yeah, that's probably <laughs> maybe my last thought. <laughs> well, thank you for doing this today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you.
I love that guy. Joe McGurl is such a great guy. Fun to be around, fun to paint with, and I learned so much from him. That's from the video Advanced Landscape Painting with Joe McGurl, and you can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. Make good use of this time. You'll never get it back. I'm Eric Rhodes. As an artist, you're on a journey. A journey to achieve at the highest possible level, to see your artwork reach the pinnacle of accomplishment, so that you're embraced by collectors who clamor to get your artwork in their collection. But practice alone will only take you so far, and if you're not careful, you'll be practicing bad habits that can stick with you for the rest of your painting life. And once you're stuck, you won't be getting as good as you could become. To make the leap to a higher level of painting, you need an advanced professional guiding you. A painter who is not only a proven success, but one whose work is considered the best of the best. Artist Joseph McGurl is known around the world as one of the finest living landscape painters on earth. His award-winning paintings are represented by the top galleries and owned by the top collectors. And his prices are among the highest in his craft because he is known as the best. That's why he has the rare distinction of having been appointed as a living master by the world-renowned Art Renewal Center. Known for his paintings of glorious light and atmosphere, which have a feeling so realistic they come alive, his paintings draw the viewer into the scene. Now, you have a chance to advance your own painting skills by learning directly from this living master in this important new video course, appropriately titled Advanced Landscape Painting. This is a rare peek into the full painting process Joseph McGurl uses to create his magnificent studio pieces. You'll see nearly every brush stroke as Joe walks you through a complete painting that begins with the outdoor sketch on a rocky main shoreline. Then, while in his studio, he explains every step to you as he transforms that sketch into a large, fully refined studio painting. Artists at every level will gain important knowledge from what is offered in this 15-hour video course. And the better you become, you'll get more out of watching it again and again. Advanced Landscape Painting with Joseph McGurl is rich in valuable content and one that you will treasure as it guides you to advance your skills. Available on both DVD and digital format to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone, be sure to order your copy today.